All right, let's begin today's session. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're each having a great day. My name is Colleen Berry. I'll be the, I'm the marketing director at Burwood Group, and I'll be your host for today's session. Our topic today, jumping right in, is dramatically improve your medical device lifecycle management, efficient practices for biomed and security teams. Uh, Burwood is thrilled to partner with Medigate on this webinar today. A little bit about our firm. Burwood is an IT consulting and integration firm headquartered in Chicago with offices and employees across the U.S. We help hospitals and healthcare systems leverage technology, technology to improve organizational and clinical outcomes. And together with Medigate, a provider of industry-leading medical device cybersecurity, we've planned an educational look today at a key outcome for hospitals and healthcare systems efficiency, really diving into how biomed and security teams can work together to improve efficiency in the security and management of their clinical devices. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. We've allocated one hour for today's session and we are recording this. A recorded version will be sent and available afterwards. We'll get it out to all of you and everyone who's registered for today's session. If you do have any questions throughout, we are happy to address them live as they come in and if we have time at the end. So please just use the chat or QA window on the right side of your WebEx browser and we'll get to whatever we can. So without further ado, let's go ahead and meet our presenters today. I'd like to introduce you to our Medigate and Burwood team members here. We have um, Tom, Market Development Director from Medigate, as well as Simeon, Director of Engineering. And then from the Burwood side, we have Mike, our Director of Healthcare Analytics, and Brian, our Security Practice Director. So the four of them today have planned a collaborative session, going back and forth, some slideware, some demos, diving into this topic of efficient biomed and security practices. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. I will hand off to Tom to go through our agenda and get us started. Take it away, Tom. Tom, you are muted, if you don't mind clicking yourself off in the WebEx window. Ah. Looks good. Uh, thank you so much, Colleen. That's a great way to get started, huh? <laughs> All <laughs> good. Um, the agenda today is pretty cut and dry, actually. Uh, we're going to cover the threat, set up the problem a little bit, uh, remind everyone uh, of what, for the most part, I think most of us as professionals in this industry already know. But then we're going to jump right into a couple of use cases, both clinical asset management, the problem and the solution around it, as well as clinical cyber hygiene, kind of addressing uh, the, in, the integrated approach um, that uh, Medigate provides. And then we'll get to some of the enabling services that bring these solutions to life um, and handle some Q&A at the end, uh, which we will certainly leave time for. So without further ado, getting into the threats I mentioned, as most of you are professionals and you, you understand the threat, I won't rattle through these particular set of statistics. There's plenty of more, plenty more of these where they came from. I'd rather say let's dial back a little bit, exercise our common sense, and and recognize that 68% of the health systems self-report that they've been hit at least once in the, in the United States. 68% is quite a number, especially when you consider that it's self-reported. Add that to the fact that we understand that healthcare presents the cyber criminal with not arguably, in fact, the most vulnerable and lucrative attack surface across industry. The reward to the cyber criminal is, depending on whose data you believe, anywhere between two, 300x that of, for example, the value of a compromised or stolen financial record. Now let's go ahead and add in what we know about the, explo the explosive growth that we're seeing in the number of uh, connected assets. These numbers are ridiculous. Um, you're looking at compounded annual growth. Uh, the data I recently reviewed, looking at numbers in the neighborhood of 20, 22 billion in 2018, expected uh, based on forecast to top out around 65 billion in 2022. That's not just explosive growth in terms of numbers. That's representative of a revolution in the way in which care is going to be provided. Connected medicine is where we're headed. 
The point is with all of those devices, whether or not they're mobile, they're stationary, whether mm -hmm. they're internal or externally de uh, deployed, whether they're connecting via home uh, public Wi-Fi or cellular networks, given the proliferation of telehealth, yet another complicating factor. At some point, they all connect to enterprise networks. And that's, of course, where the challenges lie. And, you know, one thing that has changed, I think, is that no one is debating whether or not this is a patient safety issue anymore. So the regulatory bodies are all converging around essentially <clears throat> the same uh, direction, uh, whether it's the Joint Commission, the FDA, it doesn't matter. The equivalent regulatory bodies around the globe and at the state level are all saying the same thing, and that is essentially that you've got to get a handle on what the devices are that are connected to your network, a good inventory, and you've got to take steps to secure them. So if we look at the first use case that we're going to cover today, clinical asset management, what's essentially required here is a clear line of sight to all of your endpoints. And I want to embellish here a, a bit because one man's definition of visibility is different from another's. Uh, and we've got to adopt a no compromise approach here because the technology is available and visibility at the levels that we're talking about, at the level of detail that we're talking about, enables everything. What's required is a continuously refreshed, fully profiled, dynamically risk scored inventory. Um, you need to look beyond solutions that provide, for example, make, model, and IP, although a lot of hospitals would be thrilled to have that much detail. I'm talking about fully detailed firmware level monitoring, capturing, for example, OS versions, Cap capturing application versions, all of the practical information required, something as practical as location histories, for example, more um, intimate details such as the MAC uh, OUI address. How about serial numbers? Uh, serial numbers are not necessarily um, a major concern, for example, to the information security professional but for the biomed professional that is dealing with the product recall situation, it's absolutely vital. So again, getting beyond make, model, and IP and really diving into the details, understanding the security posture of the device, the network posture of the device, and taking it again in this expanded definition of visibility, even into offline research where we can understand what the operating requirements of the device are. For example, what the internal and external connection requirements may be um, so that we can begin to alert and manage at the network level. At the same time, based on the techniques that we deploy, we're capturing utilization metrics. So we're, we're into a position through integrations with other systems to not only know how a device is utilized, but where it is being utilized and perhaps even by who. We've mentioned location information, which is critical, when the device was last seen, what its location history has been, and why does all of this matter? Why does it, where does it, the ripple effect, if you will, generate even more value? Well, when you have this kind of data quality and fidelity, the value, the meaningfulness of the integrations that you're able to support across the ecosystem, are, on, are put on steroids. They actually, for example, security policies that can be created given all of this information can be accurately and dynamically enforced. So with that, I'll tell you what, Mike, why don't we talk about it in terms of the business drivers and move forward into the problem statement and the demonstration. Thanks, Tom. Um, and I, I'd like to talk about clinical asset management as a function owned by multiple groups in the organization. These include, you mentioned uh, security, biomatter, clinical engineering, and, and of course, networking. And what we see at, at Berwick, many, many of our clients, these functions are often siloed, and we see tremendous opportunity 
and getting folks to work together more efficiently around common needs. For example, you, you mentioned, Tom, a lot of the compliance mandates from Joint Commission, FDA, manufacturer-specific recommendations. It kind of adds up to a lot of work that needs to be done, and a lot of it has to do with security vulnerability, um, and, and some of it is just maintaining the device. And so uh, there, there's really a shared need there for biomed and security to work together, and ultimately it's, it's often biomed that's kind of going out and doing the work. So what, one of the things we see is to have an effective mitigation program and remediation program that ultimately is for security, it's helpful to have a very efficient uh, proactive maintenance process. And so we, we see the need for automated systems such as Medigate to gather information from medical devices and organizes that with the work that needs to be done um, hospitals typically rely on maintenance management systems, and, and Biomed typically does a lot of manual data entry to update information as new devices are added and as new alerts come in about required mitigation. So jumping up a level, medical device lifecycle management, which increasingly is a buzzword for folks at, at the operations level of the hospital, um, a big part of that is maintaining the devices making sure they're secure, making sure they're available for end users when they need the device. And we see the current process is often inefficient. It takes a lot of time to search for the medical devices. I mentioned the manual data entry and the maintenance management systems. That, that's very difficult to keep up to date. And the lack of device usage information causes inefficiencies. Um, and, and talking more about asset utilization data, and, and Tom, I, I love the, the phrase ripple effect, you, you, you put in the monitoring primarily for security, but you get all these rippling advantages from understanding how your devices are being utilized. For example, studies have shown that the average utilization of medical devices in a hospital may be only around 42%. Um, obviously, they need some capacity to deal with peak volumes, but most hospitals see that, um, that there, there are ways to by understanding your asset usage, you can save procurement costs up front and also help allocate or move port portable medical devices across the institution more efficiently. Uh, a, a common example is many hospitals spend too much on infusion pump leasing. The better information on where and when these, these devices are actually being used, you could take, um, re re realize a significant ROI by reallocating devices from areas of underutilization to areas of overutilization, and, and again, eliminating some leasing expense. So, in fact, we, we say that using Medigate information really helps clinical engineering evolve from being a fix it organization to owning life cycle management along with other stakeholders across the enterprise. And, and Tom, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to talk about some common problems that we see clients facing. And, and to, to just try to bring this to life a little bit. Um, number one, how, how do you know what devices talking on the network are actually medical devices? Medical devices require a special management such as segmentation strategies, but a practical challenge is to identify the devices that are medical devices versus what, what's a computer or a security camera, et cetera. And so we, we've seen examples like an MRI machine that includes a network interface card running Windows. To most monitoring systems, this MRI machine at that level of data looks the same as a Windows PC workstation. So you're really not on an automatic basis, uh, on an automatic basis, getting any information that allows you to understand which other devices that, that we need to take, pay special attention to. And so what we're gonna see in the demo a Medigate uses this information to develop clinically relevant risk scores that take into account, for example, the higher severity associated with a class two medical device. Uh, number two, comment and visibility. It, it, it's a problem, just it, whether it's trying to figure out how many devices do we have, what needs to be fixed to what, and, and where are they? Um, it, it, it's a scramble to figure out where the infusion pumps and uh, especially the other portable assets are at any given time. 
And we've seen that biomed can spend up to 40% of their time on low value work, just such as looking for devices. Organizing the information systematically helps biomed be more efficient. And this is a shared benefit when you're talking about doing remediation activities for security. Medigate's dashboards provide a system of action that identifies the stuff that needs to be done and there's an easy way to visually group these steps, including location information. Number three, and, and Tom touched on this, um, biomed groups care a lot about understanding the device at, at the serial number level and, and automatically when they get information from a lot of monitoring systems, you just know stuff like um, make, model, high, high level information. Uh, and then the maintenance management system assigns a unique asset ID to every medical device, but often Biomed doesn't know the serial number information. So in a scenario where you've got a product recall that's covering a certain amount of devices, and you can kind of link that to the serial number, when you know the, the serial number itself, you're able to then link the information required kind of on, on a per device level you're able to link that exactly to the device and where it is. And so overall, there's a real powerful story here from a master data standpoint that when you have Medigate integrate with the maintenance management system, Medigate with its automated uh, kind of collection of device information automatically enriches the data. The maintenance management system knows about each device. Uh, so it eliminates a lot of manual uh, data entry and it also organizes the information around the device serial number for a single source of truth across the organization. So I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Simeon now to let him walk through a demo of how Medigate actually addresses these real world problems. Thank you very much. Uh, let me pull up my uh, demo environment and we can uh, quickly go through some of the asset management um, elements you just mentioned. Everyone can see my screen okay from that side? Yeah. Looks great. Looks good. good stuff, yes. Um, so part, part of the stuff I've mentioned earlier was around, you know, the notion of uh, driving asset data or really inventory data from a packet inspection, essentially. But what Medigate does and what we really thrive on is really understanding, essentially, the language being used across medical devices to understand exactly what's being said. Uh, if you look up here from a protocol perspective, and I'll actually select just medical devices since that's uh, the predominant conversation today. Um, Essentially, I'll give an analogy. Um, what Medigate does is essentially understands the exact language being spoken to be able to derive the relevant information or the relevant context uh, that's relevant for both from an IT perspective, a security perspective, and a biomed perspective. Um, you can see here from a distribution protocol perspective, um, protocols being used to leverage uh, to understand medical devices are not necessarily things that are usually common, if you will, to um, either IT practitioners or security practitioners. Uh, and, that, and that most of these protocols tend to be either undocumented or they are manufacturer specific. But what sets Medigate apart is we spend, you know, the, the R&D dollars and R&D efforts in understanding these protocols to, to again, be able to deterministically understand a deep level of visibility and deep level of fidelity around the data associated to devices um, on the network. Uh, the common analogy I like to make is essentially the difference between hearing the language versus understanding the language. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with other, you know, common uh, network visibility tools. Essentially, um, when they use ML-based approaches, if you will, or AI-based approach, they essentially are saying, okay, I heard a language being spoken, and because I heard that language being spoken, I will derive X, Y, and Z as far as additional context. The differentiation in Medigate is that we actually know the language being spoken, ergo the context, so the, le the level of context that can be derived is significantly more. Right, so let's say the first person heard a language being spoken was Spanish, all they know is Spanish was spoken. Medigate actually understands Spanish, understands the nuance of accents, therefore we can actually say, you know, those two people actually are from Argentina, they're speaking about, you know, X, Y, and Z, they're planning on having lunch at this particular restaurant at this particular time. Um, so the level of context, level of differentiation of that can be derived uh, with Medigate's approach is significant. And I will, you know, I'll come back to that topic, but again, um, what I want to leave here with initially is that the idea that the approach is from a deterministic understanding of the languages or the protocols being used between these devices. That said, uh, let's hop into some of the devices and I can show you exactly what I mean by that totality of view um, from a procurement and asset management perspective. 
I'll make this a bit more graphical um, to give really drive this home. Essentially, again, through that deep packet inspection or really that passive traffic analysis, if you will, Medicaid is able to understand the context of the language being spoken by these medical devices to then derive really meaningful and deep details about these devices. Um, my, one of my favorite analogies or my favorite examples to use here that really does help drive this home um, tends to be the, the infusion pump devices. Um, I'll select a specific infusion pump here to really drive this home. Uh, I know we have a mix of, you know, biomed and the security folks on the call, but uh, this will be a good example of really drive um, visibility into uh, device classes. So, for example, I'm picking a specific infusion pump. Uh, the PC unit of the infusion pump um, has a network connectivity to uh, the Wi-Fi network. By reading the Laris DCMP protocols, understanding the exact nature of what's being said between these pumps and their gateways, Medicaid is not is able to go beyond, as Tom mentioned earlier, just the, the IP address and MAC address. Uh, you know, the MAC OUI you can see here is an Ambicorp device, which is usually just a derivation of the first six characters of the MAC address. Again, not necessarily the most challenging elements of, you know, deep details into devices. This is stuff that most folks can grab either way. Where we start to really specialize is understanding, again, that granular, deeper details about these devices. Uh, you can see here, for example, that the MAC OUI or the NIC that the device um, leverages is made by a company called Ambicorp. Yet the actual device itself is made by Alaris. And that, um, as Mike was saying earlier, the commoditization of hardware has made it such that it's harder to essentially use just a, what I would call layer one through three for deep analysis of medical devices. Right? Um, he used the initial analogy was uh, around MRI, saying, okay, well, if a device both runs a, you know, an HP NIC and they're inside of an HP workstation, um, and they may both be running Windows, say, 10. Now, if you take a look at that stack, you know, the hardware looks the exact same, the NIC looks the exact same, the operating system looks the exact same, right? So until you get to the application layer and able to really derive meaningful information from the application layer, will you find any really relevant differentiation between those two devices? Ergo, we do dive deep into those protocols, again, to now go beyond just saying this is an Ambicorp Mac or UI, as it must be made by Ambicorp. By understanding the protocols, we're able to say, okay, this is an Alaris infusion pump. The exact make and model is of, is of this con conversion. Um, and the more important element here, the exact serial number of the device, because ultimately from a biomed perspective, and as Mike mentioned earlier, when it comes to time to actually remediating devices, either from a recall basis or from a segmentation basis or even from a just a simple functional cleaning basis, each individual device has to be addressed specifically. But well, you can't just say, hey, uh, all my infusion pumps have been taken care of. Uh, from a joint commission perspective, each individual specific device has to be addressed specifically. So similarly, again, the depth of details that's available from the Medigate platform goes beyond even just a serial number, and it's down to understanding the exact application version or even the firmware version being leveraged by devices, understanding in situations where they're running proprietary operating systems that may not be well documented, still having a clear understanding of the entire contextual information available around this device. So this is now from like uh, the initial elements I just showed you around what we call device-centric attributes. Right, things that are specific to the device based on its make and um, function, if you will. In addition to those parts, um, as uh, Mike and Tom also alluded earlier, is location data is being, uh, being available. By leveraging integrations with wireless systems or even uh, wired systems as well to say switch management systems, for example, or your wireless management systems like you know, Aruba Airwave and Aruba-centric networks or Cisco Prime and Cisco-centric networks, we're also able to derive you know, the location data down to the exact you know, building and location of the exact AP to also then leverage things like you know, physical location context. Right? Because ultimately, um, just kind of back up here, what, what often is missing is the contextual information around these devices from a device-centric perspective, but again, from a location-centric perspective as well too. And um, in our next um, you know, element, we'll talk more about the risk scoring methodologies, but um, I want to focus again more on like having the understanding of the device and how it flows through the network. In this situation, you know, having a clear understanding about how this infusion pump goes from, say, one location to another, the current location of the infusion pump, all provide a level of, you know, I would call physical context um, that's an additional element about exactly where this specific device is and exactly how the specific device is used in the network. Um, to so further I'd drive like to home the elements. With a question, yes. if I can, we have a relevant question in the Q&A. From John, how do devices get loaded into Medigate? Do you have to add each device manually, or does Medigate use some sort of broadcast method to discover devices? 
that's a fantastic question. Um, so Medigate essentially has, uh, the, again, the language of these devices that are being used. And as we parse network traffic passively to understand you know, what's being said in the network, we will derive the relevant network devices, medical devices, IoT devices, and all, really all devices in a, what we call IOHT network, or Internet Healthcare Things. So we don't necessarily load devices in manually. Essentially, we are in real time picking up these devices and understanding exactly what the devices are and then presenting them in a dashboard um, for our system. It's a great question, Colleen. Thanks. I think yeah. I would only add, just add one point there, which is critical. It's implied, but it's dynamic. It's continuous. So as things change, those changes are captured. Um, there's no fire drill run here to figure out what the endpoints are and how they're um, uh, attributed. Um, this is, think in terms of a moving picture um, where things are continuously refreshed based on how they change and remediation work, for example, that has been proactively uh, taken. Thank you, Tom. Great, great addition. Uh, yeah, so to Tom's, Tom's point, um, absolutely. You know, this is our dynamically um, created system. And uh, one of the relevant parts here is that we can also then take this relevant data and in real time also incorporate it into feeding things like your CMS platforms or your asset management systems from a more IT security side of things. Uh, things like, you know, Novolo, ServiceNow, uh, AIMS, et cetera. But we'll cover that um, briefly. I wanted to just quickly get back to the deep packet inspection and really the prowess in which Medigate is able to uh, leverage um, deep packet inspection. Ultimately, deep packet inspection is not a technology per se, it's more like an a idea or a skill set. By going as deep as possible and really understanding the language being spoken by these devices, again, you'll hear me harp on that, you were able to now derive not just say, for example, the actual infusion pump that's connected to the network, but um, I'm not sure if all the folks on the call are familiar with uh, Larry's infusion pump systems, but essentially uh, behind the actual, what they call the PC units, uh, there are serial connected modules that have no actual network connectivity to the network per se, but still need to communicate to the EMR and still transfer communications via the Alaris uh, PC units. Medigate's depth in deep packet inspection and really understand the protocols these devices are using allows us to actually tease out the relevant information for these serial connected devices that aren't technically in the network. And I'll show you really the, what I mean by this. So you can see, for example, up here, the, the actual base units has a specific application version, has a specific serial number, has a specific operating system. Right? It's, it's its own medical device. Behind this device are, you know, things, for example, like a CO2 uh, module, which I'll click into. It's its own also medical device, but it has no network connectivity per se in that it's a, it simply clicks behind the, the base unit. You can see here, again, by having the depth of understanding and depth of knowledge around these devices, both from a clinical focus as to what they should be doing, as well as from a depth of IT security and understanding exactly how these devices connect and exactly how they communicate. We're also able to now understand the make and models of devices behind the, the Alaris infusion pumps, down to, again, the different operating systems they're running, the different application versions of firmware these devices also carry out, and the specific serial numbers of these modules associated behind um, the Alaris infusion pump. Now, again, this cannot be done by that notion of saying, I heard this language being spoken, therefore it must be X, Y, and Z. You have to understand the depth of communication being used and the depth of communication being, you know, leveraged by these devices to be able to have this really next generation level of visibility into your medical device classes all in real time while also being pop pop populated into your um, inventory asset management systems. Um, so we so, have another question I'd like to jump in with from David. Are please, you spanning absolutely. or tapping? Yeah, are you spanning or tapping the network to passively gather? Excellent. Uh, for situations where taps already exist, uh, things like Gigamon or, you know, Ixir, we can absolutely leverage those infrastructure to have, you know, be a service port of those systems. For elements where there are no current taps in place or no current, you know, plans for impl implementing taps, we can help the, uh, the you know, the HDO configure spans and simply feed the Medigate box. Uh, to drive that question even further I mean, from a technical perspective, we essentially need to be, our collection server needs to be um, somewhere between where the medical devices sit at the access layer and somewhere where the devices or the management servers that service these uh, medical devices exist in the data center. So whether it's a layer two or layer three uh, network, 
it doesn't really matter. So long as the Medicaid collection server exists somewhere between those streams, we can provide the relevant information and therefore the depth of knowledge around these devices. Um, two, two more points really around the asset management thesis. Um, it's understanding again the communication streams, which we'll talk, we'll talk more about this around when we talk about uh, cyber hygiene and really how to secure these devices once you have a depth of understanding around these devices. Ultimately, across all you know, security frameworks, whether you're following NIST or whether you're following you know, a Common Core, uh, they all start with identification, right? And so first, you have to identify the devices and identify them at a granularity and have a totality of view around all devices that are within purview before you can then start begin creating you know, cybersecurity uh, measures or really network composite and controls around these devices. Um, the last piece I want to touch on briefly um, around the asset utilization is really having a clear understanding around utilization as well, too. Right. Again, because Medicaid is a continuous, you know, real-time understanding of these devices across the network, we, know, we don't only understand things like, okay, when is the device actually being used versus not being used, and, and what's the summarization of the device across the network, but more so, because again, the, the depth of understanding of DCMP, or well, in this case, I'll say the language being spoken, we actually understand the difference between when the device, say, is just online and sending keep a live message saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm on the network, Whereas when the device is actually infused and actually sending communication streams um, of saying, hey, I'm actually doing my job now. So what you see here uh, between the red and, I'm sorry, the green and blue, um, is essentially is just that, device in use versus device just online. This now gives a, a clearer depth of understanding around, okay, how my device is being used, which then can be derived into a utilization heat map to say, you know, when can I service this device, for example, right? When is the device not being in use? We can now see where now we now have a clear understanding from a, from a location perspective and a clear understanding of a usage perspective to help drive things like preventative maintenance and drive things like, you know, proper asset management. Now, this is from an individualistic view. I want to quickly touch from a fleet view, if you will, to say, okay, well, now I understand what this one particular device does from a utilization perspective, but how about my entire fleet of infusion pumps, for example? You know, where, how, how do, do I have too many? Do I have too little? You know, exactly what level of visibility, if you will, do I have into what's my, um, my asset management systems? We can also provide that depth of visibility across the fleet. I'm not quite sure my demo is freezing up here, uh, but safe to say that um, that same level of utilization data can be tracked across the fleet as well, too. Um, so with that, I will quickly pause and um, we'll continue the next topics. Sounds good. Uh, Simeon, maybe I'm going to grab control for a second. It's Brian from Burwood. Talk a little bit about hygiene. And I think uh, between the two of us, we can hopefully have a little bit of dialogue. I, I want to leave enough time so you can show the demo for the cellular hygiene as well. But I think we just want to touch on the second use case we're going to talk about today, which is how do you protect those devices that are on the, that are on the network? How do you leverage your current vulnerability management data? And how do you really build a vulnerability, vulnerability management program that includes connected medical devices as well as maybe more traditional IT assets? Um, as we think about what, the, what we're really trying to accomplish when we look at a hospital environment and how we can integrate vulnerability management into that environment, we know that a lot of times IT and security operations teams have a, have a set of tools they're using. Uh, back to the question that was asked in the first section about uh, how do you profile devices? A lot of those tools that security teams use today are are, are uh, probing devices, interrogating devices, actively reaching out and, and using them or, or using an installed agent. We don't have that functionality a lot of times when we're working with a medical device. We can't install an agent. We typically don't have a good profile for the operating system. We typically can't interrogate that agent directly. So we really need to understand those risks. Um, we always had a mantra in vulnerability management, you can't secure what you don't know you have. So of course, the first step we just talked about, the whole asset inventory piece is really important. Understanding what you have in your environment, where those devices are, what they're communicating with, helps you get that baseline for what do I need to do to secure those devices. But then we need to be able to risk prioritize those devices. And this is where the challenge comes a lot of times for biomed organizations is you aren't working with risk prioritized information a lot of the time. You're working with uh, information from the manufacturer or information from regulatory bodies, and it's more of a maintenance schedule. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a periodic touch of those devices as opposed to touching them when there's really a risk, uh, a, real, a real risk feature. So being able to take 
the processes we use on the workstations and servers where we evaluate vulnerabilities and we look at things like CVE to give us a risk score. We want to be able to do that same thing with biomed devices. So being able to correlate that information is super important. Um, as we look at then what we can do to then start to structure the response for that is how do we and how do we take again our current vulnerability management processes same way we handle updates security patches and and and, uh, and basic vulnerability uh, this vulnerability management for our for our computing devices how do we apply that to the biomed device in the same space and we want to do that using the same kind of criteria right risk and posture and location and all the things that we can get uh, from what we're what we have in Medicaid. Absolutely. So maybe if I if I can take just a second to talk about what we see on the cyber hiding side, uh, a lot of organizations are are running in silos. I think this is a big problem. We see a lot of medical organ or a lot of hospital organizations where the biomed team is managing devices on a periodic schedule based on a maintenance program, and the IT and security risk teams are using a vulnerability scanning tool, let's say something like a Nessus or a Qualys, to do real-time evaluation of risks and, and managing their vulnerabilities that way. But the two don't always interact. This is a real chance for us to get efficiency in this space. How can we take those two, de those two data sources and meld them together into one uh, inventory system that's got all the information we need about those devices and can do it in a proactive manner? So we want to be able to integrate those two those two platforms and really get the same get that risk prioritization information. Um, the second one is that problem of maintenance schedules for medical devices are typically driven by a periodic review or scheduled review. Uh, in my life, I'm a pilot. I fly an airplane. Uh, mm -hmm. Airplanes have tons of parts that you have to inspect on a periodic basis, right? There's 50 hour and 100 hour inspections. That's sort of how I think about medical devices a lot of times. They're, they're, they follow that same kind of mentality. But what we found out in aviation and what we found out in healthcare is that it's more, uh, it's more beneficial if we can react when there's a problem. If we're, if we're looking at a, a piece of equipment not just on its 200-hour rotation, but we're watching for key indicators that that might be failing, right? We're seeing uh, leakage. We're seeing a, a loss of power. We're seeing some kind of a, of a real-time indicator. We can make an adjustment to our to our maintenance schedule and fix something faster other than other than waiting for it to, to happen on its regular schedule. Um, so solution here is really how can we move from those periodic or interval based maintenance programs into one that's more real time and using that real time data and like Tom was talking about at the beginning having a having an inventory that's constantly updated that's constantly adjusting that's constantly learning about these devices to make those uh, maintenance events more uh, more, pro more proactive in our environment. And then finally, the, the really big challenge with, the, with biomed devices is that we, we know that these are providing patient safety uh, functions in a lot of cases. And so they can't be interrogated, they can't be uh, scanned. In a lot of cases, they might be on separate subnets where we can't see them with our vulnerability management tools. Uh, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna have the risk of those devices either being impacted from a operational perspective or, uh, or, or of them um, being, being, uh, being bogged down by the process, right? If we're, if we're interrogating them, we don't want them to stop doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, so passive device collection is huge. And it, again, back to the question we had a little bit ago about how does Medigate get that information, the deep packet inspection through passive network monitoring means that that device is not, a, is not being interrogated directly. We're not impacting the operation of that device while we're asking or while we're collecting data about it. So there's not a risk that that device is going to tip over or, or become inoperable in some way. So it helps us uh, be able to have more real-time collection. We're not running scans weekly, monthly, quarterly. We're getting it all the time. And we're not impacting the device, which is great. And we, uh, we know that it's predictable what we're getting out of that device. So really having um, a real-time uh, informed database of, of real-time threat gives us a better gives us a better outcome and also make sure that that patient stays safe. Absolutely. So just to add on to that, Brian, um, you're absolutely right. You know, the passive technology I mean, or passive collection really is the true methodology of solving this. Uh, but more importantly, as you were mentioning, there was almost like a weird relationship, right, between the fact that the most critical devices in the network and the most, you know, immediate device uh, also represent the devices that you can't leverage your most traditional skill sets on. 
things like install an antivirus, things like, you know, install an updates, and, you know, like you mentioned also vulnerability scans. The, the common tool sets of a security practitioner are almost, you know, hindered or cannot be used uh, for these particular devices. So really it becomes the passive methodologies and really the network compensating controls to manage the risk elements. Um, and I'll, I'll dive into the demo really to show that, but um, you're absolutely spot on there. Yeah. yeah, and I think one thing we didn't talk about, and two is that we know that there's a ton of devices that are biomed, uh, biomed capable that tend to run on operating systems that are out of date. There might not be security patches, there might not be fixes. And we have to be able to identify those devices as well. We all know, right? It's not as simple as a PC where we say, well, Windows 7 went out of life, replace the PC, get a new one. Can't do that with an MRI machine that might have an embedded operating system that's out of date. We have to find a way to, to, to understand what the traffic flow is, isolate that traffic flow, and protect that device. And what you're going to show here is exactly how that happens for us in an automated way. Exactly. Um, so again, I'll, I'll use another device uh, to kind of really drive home what we're talking about here. Uh, in this case, um, I, think in a, I think an imaging device would be uh, more, more fun, if you will. Um, again, you know, the depth of visibility, understanding, again, just the make and model beyond just saying this is a, you know, a radiology device. It's saying this is a, you know, Philips IU33, the exact serial number of the device, the exact application version. And this is when it really starts to become important, right, uh, the application version and the serial numbers. Um, so let's quickly talk about the risk score methodologies. Um, you know, what affects the risk score and, and really what are the, how we can simulate our responses and then what the network compensating controls or the, the network um, elements we can use to really bring uh, security to these devices. So you can see here, for example, um, to briefly talk about our risk score methodologies. So we, we uh, you know, leverage FDA, NIST, as well as ECRI and Amy's uh, methodologies around, um, you know, impact around medical devices. But essentially, um, it's an impact versus likelihood calculation. Uh, the likelihood calculation is derived from the device vulnerability or, you know, device-centric vulnerabilities, as well as the network-centric elements, right? So from a device-centric vulnerability perspective, um, we talk about things like, okay, uh, what operating system is the device running? In this case, it's running, you know, Windows XP uh, embedded, which is an unsupported operating system. So again, from a device-centric view, that would be a fairly risky element. Similarly, does the device have any known vulnerabilities, either from a platform perspective, AKA the operating system perspective, or does it have any known vulnerabilities from, a, from an application layer perspective, right? So uh, the DICOM images that are being sent from this device somehow affected by a, by a particular, you know, application layer vulnerability. Similarly, of course, from a device-centric view, does the device have any outdated firmware, AKA have we seen new versions of the, operating, you know, of the application? Or does the device also have any endpoint security or AV installed on it? All that speaks towards uh, the device's vulnerability or how easily the device can be hacked, if you will. Now, just because the device can be hacked, but if it can't be reached, then that's also another element of security, right? So similarly, we then break it down all as well into what type of network does the device sit on. So if the device sits on a wireless or wired connection versus, say, a gateway connection, so those are things like the infusion pump modules I showed you earlier, those would essentially be in a gateway connection that it cannot be reached directly via the network. Ergo, the security around them is significantly much more than, say, a device that's directly connected to a, a, a layer two, layer three network. Additionally, um, the type of VLAN or the type of layer two adjacency the device has also comes into play with the level of, you know, reachability or exploitability of those vulnerabilities, right? So an analogy would be, um, I may have a Windows 95 machine that I've never patched ever that has, I don't know, maybe a thousand vulnerabilities. But if I was to disconnect from the network and put it in a closet, it wouldn't be reachable, therefore it would not be exploitable. So I may still have the vulnerabilities associated, but the exploitability would be reduced. Similarly, that all goes towards the calculation of the device's vulnerability or the, the, the likelihood of the device being compromised. Now, from a severity perspective, which is also mapped to as an impact, uh, we essentially are calculating here, okay, well, what, how bad would it be if this device was compromised? In this case, you know, the, the FDA class, uh, the one, two, or three, three being direct life support patient, um, life patient supporting devices, type one being like a test kit, that all goes again towards the impact of how bad it would be if the device was hacked. Similarly, things like the financial cost, uh, the consequences of failure, whether the device stores or transmits PHI data, all, again, calculate, are calculated towards uh, the severity of, again, how bad would this be if this device is compromised. Now, I'm going to quickly jump into the risk simulator because this really helps illustrate, again, um, what I just mentioned earlier, but in a much more graphical perspective. 
Now, as we as we may or may not be aware, um, oftentimes when it comes to dealing with this, the the risk associated with these devices, unfortunately, you know, the device centric elements or the device vulnerabilities are often cannot be remediated because you know oftentimes you re it requires direct interactions with the manufacturer, and the manufacturers essentially say, unless the patch comes from us, um, installing that soft piece of software will invalidate your warranty. So oftentimes HDO is a stuck situation where they need to trade cybersecurity remediation for potential, you know, patient or potential financial issues as a result of, you know, invalidating the warranty. Um, but again, this kind of gives us a good understanding of, um, okay, what should our efforts be towards remediating this high-risk device? Um, we can, of course, you know, we're not going to be able to change the operating system, obviously, because, you know, it's an embedded operating system. Perhaps we can get the patches from the manufacturer so we can apply patches to those devices. So you can see, you know, the level of, of uh, risk now post that um, patching. But again, that's not likely. So I'm going to go ahead and return these back on and assume again that the device um, posture, if you will, stays the same. We're not gonna change the network connectivity, nor we're gonna change the network it is on. So really these elements here become the pieces in which we can use uh, the network composite and controls, if you will, to really help derive as help um, secure these devices. You can see here the device sits in a mixed VLAN. So it has, it sits in a VLAN that has, you know, both you know, IT assets and cameras and really just general IoT devices that could be easily compromised, as well as it has connections to the internet, right? So this now represents a fairly risky posture from a network-centric perspective. And currently it has a default ACL, which is probably just allow all, if you will. So all communications are really allowed to this network, this network device. So ergo, the real, and you can see lastly, uh, the piece of from a security perspective, we can't change the severity, right? You can't change how bad it would be if this device is compromised, unfortunately. So really, that were only true elements left is more network side of things to so say, okay, let's let's control the network, if you will, so we can allow and control devices that go that communications that go to that device. So if I was to now take this action as far as okay, I want to now actually instead of enforcing default ACL, I'm going to enforce or mitigate recommended ACL, and as well as put this device say on a, on a uniform VLAN. This now significantly reduces my my risk because now I, the device sits in the network that only you know. It's not adjacent, but it has layer two adjacency to risky devices. And we've now controlled the type of or type of traffic that can be that can reach this device. You can see here we haven't changed uh, the, the vulnerability perspective or the device-centric vulnerability, nor have we changed the severity of harm that would occur if the device was compromised, but we've now reduced the type of traffic that can come to the device and placed in a fairly segmented posture, ergo while it's still a risky device from a vulnerability perspective, it's not reachable, it cannot be exploited, therefore the risk has been significantly reduced. Right? So again, in the situations, especially for medical devices, it becomes a much more of a conversation around network compensating controls and, the, and how we can really lay up on uh, these controls across the network. These controls, of course, can be, you know, it can be ACLs from a downloadable ACL, they can be uh, firewall implemented. The policy enforcement engine ultimately doesn't necessarily matter, what matters here is that Medigate is able to extract the, through clinical research, we understand exactly how the device should function in the network. We then layer that on top of what the device is communicating, right? So to, to run this back quickly, we run, you know, research and understanding about these ultrasound devices, for example, from Philips. We have an exact understanding of the type of communication it needs to do its function. We then mirror that or match that, if you will, with observed communication in the network, okay? Because ultimately, you know, all networks and all deployments of specific devices are going to be fairly unique. Um, so, for example, I might have, a, you know, a radiology device that I, I use in my network as X, and in another environment can be used as Y. Uh, so we then mirror that what's custom to that environment to then, to then inform the totality of our ACLs. To quickly break down the safety diagram here, you'll see that we break the communications down to external and internal, and then the, the protocols being used as well as the destinations um, it, once they are either profiled or even unprofiled for things like broadcast traffic. Um, you can see this being a, an ultrasound, most of the communication is going to be DICOM. As you can see there, for example, this represents about 61% of all traffic on the network. Um, the beauty of this, like I mentioned earlier, is that we're now able to understand and then derive or mitigate recommended ACL in this case, it's being expressed as a Cisco ICE, as, um, Cisco ICE format. But safe to say this can be expressed either as an Aruba role, it can be expressed as a firewall from, from Palo Alto. The enforcement engine essentially is uh, not important, if you will. <laughs> it, it's really the type of uh, ACL, the, the depth of knowledge you know, that uh, presents the controls, if you will. That's really the key element here. 
Um, and so I really wanted to leave you guys with that piece so make, make sure you understood that not only does Medicaid provide the level of visibility from an understanding exactly what the device is down to the depths of saying this is the exact make, model, serial number, here are the associated CVEs potentially you know, associated with the device from a large perspective, which again, all go towards understanding the cyber hygiene. Um, but it then also speaks to us then, okay, what should I do with this device, right? From a, if I'm gonna understand my, my risk, how can I simulate it before I actually go and put it into my network? How can I respond to this and understand how I can respond prior to actually implementing the recommended ACLs uh, that Medigate would also provide for, for us? The one last piece I wanna mention quickly around uh, on cyber hygiene, I know we're kind of running short on time here, is um, from a threat perspective, Medicaid also understands, you know, as threats are published and uh, as new CVEs are published, we don't only, you know, present them and have you make sure they're relevant, not relevant for you. Uh, Medicaid's, uh, Medicaid lab section of our company also goes through, understands exactly, you know, whether the devices or the CVEs associated to your specific environment, and if they are, we actually correlate those specific devices that are affected down to the specific CVEs. Right, so um, case in point, I'll pick a specific one here. Just out of the, let me find one that's interesting. This guy, for example, this this, this is a CVE that that affects specific Roche uh, glucose meters, and we'll dive deeper and just kind of quickly go through this. You'll see that, for example, this is this this is a CVE published, you know, to US CERT has specific description and specific defective devices. In this case, I believe it's the base stations that are affected. And you can see here that the specific application version of devices are running and the specific make and models now becomes relevant from a cybersecurity response perspective. Because ultimately, from this, from this alert, it's understanding the exact make and model and understanding the exact you know, effects of these devices is now what correlated and understood the saying, okay, it's not just a CVE that's been published out there now, it's a CVE that's been published and it affects these exact 208 devices in my inventory. One more thing I wanna call out on this topic because he would kill me if I didn't, this, is this exact CD was actually um, discovered and published by one of my peers um, and at Medigate uh, NIV. Um, this is not too bad, but it's, again, this is the kind of function that the Medigate Labs uh, piece of the company also does, is that we do the actual you know, first-hand research to understand the CVEs associated with these devices and then disclose them to the manufacturer in a safe and responsible way to really help drive the overall cybersecurity um, elements around medical devices as a whole. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, we are HDOs and healthcare only, so we are also incentivized to really help discover these CVEs and help drive a safer environment in healthcare. Um, so with that, um, I will pause and I will hand that over. Well, not quite hand over, but back to the, the slides, please. Simeon, I'm going to suggest in the interest of time here that um, we move through this. Uh, I think it's been very clear from all of the presentations that the the I idea here I is to come to a, a single source of truth, a common data foundation that's been missing forever. Once that common foundation is available, it can be accessed cross-functionally, and there's an awful lot of operational benefit here, which ties back to return on investment, which is, of course, important. Um, <clears throat> so with that, let's I, I want one let's more comment, please, Tom. I want, yeah. I want to quickly close this out quickly. I want to say it's about device intelligence and the intelligence that can be derived from devices. That's the key element I want to leave with is that there's a lot of intelligence within those devices and if you can leverage them, like you just mentioned, there's a lot of ROI that can be, that can be achieved. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Tom, I think we can wrap it up too. Uh, I'm gonna leave this, I'll leave these couple of slides at the end. They're, they're great information about how Burwood can help healthcare organizations not only look just at biomed, but at their whole vulnerability management program, how you can really start to build a proactive management uh, of these of devices and of biomed, and really how we can help bring that efficiency together, help biomed and IT operational teams to leverage the data they have, to integrate vulnerability management programs, and to look at ways you can gain efficiency, both from the management side, as well as the deployment side. Um, a lot of the data we talked about today in the in the asset management portion of the of the presentation can help go a long ways towards planning for purchasing and procurement of future devices, and uh, there's a lot of ways we can help with efficiencies there too. So, um, with that, uh, you know, we we would love to we'd love to chat more with organizations who are really looking at how to be more proactive, how to be more forward looking, and how to find efficiencies in their maintenance programs. 
I'd love to leave a couple minutes for questions, but I think we have a couple. So maybe yeah. we'll turn it back to you, Colleen. Excellent. Thanks, Brian, and thank you all for the presentation today. We do have one that came in, uh, to me in towards the end of your second demo from John. Can you manage medical devices that are not network connected? So, John, unfortunately, um, you know, Medicaid is a uh, you know, network. We, 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 uh, we consume network traffic to derive the information that we provide. So, unfortunately, devices have to be connected to the network or at the very least connected to a gateway, if you will, or a, you know, a capsule or a medical device integrator. But essentially, the device has to send traffic through the network for us to be able to parse and use our deep packet inspection to provide the visibility that you saw today. Got it. Thanks, Simeon. And then we've talked a lot about overall benefits of Medigate, Medigate and Burwood together. When we, when you Google, you know, cybersecurity, medical device, IoT, lots of vendors come up, lots of results come up. What specifically is different about the Medigate platform, if any, that other things cannot do? It's a fantastic question. Um, I think two things, to be completely frank. Uh, the first piece is the, is the dedication to a specific domain. Uh, Medigate is a, med it's a healthcare only company. Uh, so our expertise and our R&D are entirely focused on the HDOs and providing the depth of visibility into their environments. Um, other companies tend to focus more across, you know, all verticals, and are essentially trying to capture uh, revenue across all verticals. Medicaid does not do that. We focus strictly on HDOs. Uh, from a technical piece, uh, secondly, it's about, again, what I mentioned earlier, the, the approach from really understanding the language being spoken. Right? Oftentimes when you Google, you know, um, you know IoT and IOMT solutions, they are using essentially stats-based approach, right? They have probabilistic approaches of saying, okay, if I heard a device speak this way to that person, then it's likely to be this thing within a level of confidence. Medicaid's approach is a much more deterministic approach that says this exact, set, this exact sentence was said between these two devices, therefore I'm going to report it back. It's very specific and very, in, very important in the, in the healthcare space because it's not, it's not saying, okay, that's a medical device. You have to know the exact make and model and the exact serial number for each individual device, and that can only be derived through a level of deep packet inspection that goes all the way up to, again, to understand the language being spoken. Excellent. Thanks, Damian. All right, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, no additional questions in the chat here, so I'll just open it up back to the panelists. Anyone, uh, any last words? Otherwise, we'll close out for today. I just... I'd like to add, in, in terms of how we're differentiated, uh, being healthcare dedicated and having been involved in tech transfer into the acute care vertical for many decades now, um, it matters. The, the nuance of healthcare is reflected in our platform. The offline research that is done uh, is something that we can do because we have no competing development or service agendas. This is all about healthcare. <clears throat> it's all about empowering um, cross-functional teams that address this problem space vis-a-vis -a, -vis a common data foundation. It's important. Um, I think that uh, as well as we, we cut it short towards the end, our partnership with Burwood is such that there's a tremendous amount of synergy that we've developed in expediting valuable integrations that take advantage of that common data foundation. So uh, I think things move much more rapidly than uh, might be uh, guessed, given how quickly we're able to, to access that information and make it available. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, I think if I could build on Tom, your comment, one of the biggest struggles that we see at Burwood in helping health organizations get their arms around uh, not only just biomed security, but but network segmentation and, and and building towards a zero trust environment in their in their enterprise is that it's a big it feels like a big thing to bite off, and the dynamic ACLs that uh, Simeon was showing are enormously powerful at cutting that time and really simplifying the ability to begin to build zero trust in the environment. So, I think that's one of the biggest challenges I hear all the time is we just don't know where to start or we or it's just too daunting we can help really get that under control. Yeah, I would just, Brian, I would, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, beyond CMMS integration, which is a natural that probably occurs across 95% of our clients right out of the gate, I'd say network segmentation support 
um, is probably our biggest business driver. And I frankly don't know how you go down that path without having this kind of visibility, the, the project delays, the stalls that we've all experienced and are aware of over the last several years serve as evidence there. Um, it's not uncommon, and I'm sure, Brian, you can speak to this, where network segmentation project timeframes are cut by half. Mm -hmm. Yep, Absolutely. for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you all, Tom, Simeon, Mike, and Brian, for joining us today. Thank you, listeners and attendees. We will get the recording link as well as your Grubhub credits out on Monday morning. So please look out for the follow-up info then. Uh, and as you can see, our contact info is on the screen here. We would love to connect with you, uh, talk more about your current situation, take suggestions for future webinar topics as well. So please reach out to Tom or Mike or our team, and we'd be happy to chat. With that, I will wrap this up. So thanks again, everyone, for joining Burwood and Medigate today, and hope you each have a wonderful day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.